Here are 10 things that don't usually make it into brief descriptions of Rust. In the brief pitch, usually memory safety and performance take center stage. These 10 things go a little bit deeper and some extend beyond the language and into its ecosystem. Number one, exclusive mutability. The borrow checker is for more than just memory safety. It also helps with data consistency. In this example, we retrieve a mutable reference to the vector and later try to get a shared reference to the vector before the mutable reference goes out of scope. This won't compile, which is amazing because if we have a shared reference to something, we can have confidence its state won't change for the lifetime of that reference. One way to think of it is that it's a free compile time read write lock for every piece of data in your program. By free, I mean there's no performance overhead because all the checks are done at compile time. Next up is number one, I mean number two. Had a little data consistency issue there. DREF coercion. One of the things that stands out the most when learning Rust is its smart pointers. I made a whole video about smart pointers, but one thing that's nice about smart pointers is that once you put something in one, you can directly call methods on the contained type as if the smart pointer isn't even there. It's like they're invisible, which is the opposite of my C++ bugs, which were very visible. Number three, destructuring. This one is near and dear to my heart. If you spent any amount of time with Java or something similar, you're probably sick of deep nested if else blocks. In Rust, with destructuring, we can replace this entire monstrosity with this. It lets us check for entire hierarchies of structure without writing separate conditionals for each level of the hierarchy. Destructuring is a great example of how Rust prioritizes developer sanity. I mean, code readability. Number four is futures stream iter. There are several crates under an umbrella crate called futures that collectively provide some key functionality for async Rust. There is a function in the stream module called iter that accepts an iterator and returns a stream, which is kind of like an iterator of futures. If you have a collection of something and you need to make an API request for each element, this pattern might be a good fit. You can map each element of the stream to an async operation and use buffer unordered to specify a maximum number of pending futures. That way you can ensure there aren't too many running in parallel. Results are funneled back into another collection. So even though API requests are parallelized, you're never dealing directly with a future. Kind of like that guy in the cubicle next to you. Number five, Tokyo Select. This is a lesser known cousin of Tokyo Join but it is definitely one that you want in your tool belt. Join handles the case where you have two or more futures and you wanna wait for all of them to resolve. Select is for cases where you want to do something immediately when the first future resolves. One simple use case is requesting the same data from different sources and just using whichever one responds the fastest. Another use case is running some keep alive logic while another future is pending. Select actually accepts input in the form of a DSL that looks kind of like a match block where each arm describes what to do if a particular future completes first. Next up is spawn. No, not that one, this one. You might know that an async function doesn't actually execute until you call dot await on the future that it returns. You might think if you pass these futures to join, the two functions will run in parallel. Surprise, they don't. They run concurrently, but not in parallel. In other words, execution might switch back and forth between function A and B, but they will never both be executing at the same time. That's because as written, everything here is executing on one thread. There are a few ways to get A and B to potentially run in parallel, one of which is using Tokyo spawn. This puts the operation in what's called a Tokyo task and cues it for being executed by Tokyo's thread pool. Threads on the thread pool can spread across CPUs and thus potentially run in parallel. Deciding whether to use Tokyo spawn or just calling async functions directly is a pretty interesting topic and is deserving of its own dedicated video. Number seven is lazy lock. I don't miss a ton about Java, but one thing I do miss is the ability to initialize static fields right where they are declared. In Rust, you can do this if the value can be computed at compile time, basically it's a literal or a const function, but anything outside of that won't work at least not without something like lazy lock. Lazy lock lets you initialize static variables in the same place they are declared. Of course, the other thing is that lazy lock is, well, lazy. Your initialization logic isn't run until the static field is read for the first time. That can be a really big deal if initialization is expensive and or the static field is seldom needed. Number eight is leptos. Everyone pretty much agrees that building front ends in Rust is a great idea, so I'm surprised that this one isn't more well known. It's not a pattern or idiom, it's actually a crate. These days, 
days, nobody would be phased if you choose Rust as a language for your back end. But not many realize it's a pretty viable candidate for your front end too. Leptos is a full stack framework for writing your front end and back end in Rust. What's more is that it makes the interface between the two seamless. Calling a back end API from the front end is just a function call. Leptos is awesome. Number nine. Explicit module inclusion. This is something I absolutely hated when I first started. Not only have I come around to it, I've grown to prefer it. I'm talking about the explicit inclusion of modules with mod statements. At first I considered these overly verbose. Then I realized they're actually really powerful, especially because you can make them conditional on features that are enabled. Entire modules can be conditionally included instead of polluting the module with if else statements. Speaking of features, that's the next one. Every crate has a set of features that can be toggled on or off. Like I said, pieces of code can be included or excluded in the build depending on the states of specific features. In this way, you can cater to specific situations or target platforms. When adding a library as a dependency, you get full control over the enabled features for that library. Did I say this video is about 10 things? Well, here's a bonus one. Number 11, no billion dollar mistake. You could argue that this one isn't underrated, but it does tend to get excluded from brief discussions of Rust. Rust does not have the billion dollar mistake, which is of course, nullability. Values are not nullable. In my Java days, I saw enough null pointer exception for a few lifetimes, so it's great that Rust doesn't even have null. If you'd like to see all of this put into practice, check out this video where I walk through a terminal-based LLM chatbot written in Rust. If you like this video format, you know, where I don't actually show my face, you can make me extremely happy and sad at the same time by clicking that like button. If I left out your favorite thing about Rust, let's go ahead and fight about it down in the comments. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.